Hi, Karen. Hi, Shirley. Good to see you all. Good afternoon, colleagues. Thank you for joining us and welcome to another GECO session that is the Gastroenterology and Hepatology Echo Clinics. I will talk a little bit more about what we're hoping to achieve. We had 84 registrations, I'm pleased to announce. And so far we have about 51 participants online and I'm pretty sure more of our participants will join in the next few minutes. We have colleagues from all over Africa, from Zambia, Namibia, Kenya, Ghana, Tanzania, Zimbabwe, and of course, South Africa. Welcome to each and all of you. I'm going to share my screen because I just like to talk a little bit about Project ECHO and what we are hoping to achieve uh, with these um, meetings. So for those of you who are not familiar with Project ECHO, it is um, an abbreviation for the extension for community healthcare outcomes. It is a collaborative model of medical education and care management it aims to empower clinicians everywhere so that they can provide better care for their patients at the place where the patients are. It is different to telemedicine in that it does not really actually provide direct care to the patients. What it does instead is that it dramatically increases access to speciality treatment uh, in patients uh, and in, uh, with physicians that may be based in rural areas or outside the teaching um, centers. And the idea is that we help to the physicians to manage the patients who have complex uh, conditions uh, at the site where they are. It does this by engaging clinicians in a continuous learning module where um, clinicians all over the place are partnered with mentors at academic centers. And the way in which it achieves this is that it uses didactic lectures as well as case presentations so that it can foster an all learn or teach approach. What is really, I think, um, humbling and fascinating about this model is that it aims to democratize and demonopolize medical education by linking interdisciplinary specialty teams with multiple primary care clinics. Now, the reason I mentioned this is that I'm not sure how many of you on this call may have been exposed to the COVID echo uh, meetings. And those meetings, you'll note, uh, took the form of seminars. And I think that was necessary because of how rapidly information needed to be uh, disseminated. Um, and so that was, that's not really in keeping with the traditional um, uh, model of Project ECHO. What we are hoping to do is to actually go back to the original model, which is that of one didactic lecture and then case-based presentation so that it can be a dialogue and an interactive uh, teaching uh, session where as it states uh, in, in the vision, uh, where we can all learn from each other and we can all teach each other something. So in this context, I'd like to encourage you to please, please send us the cases that you have. The cases don't have to be difficult. Uh, they can be just you know, uh, assistance with managing patients, diagnostics, or even therapy. So please contact Karen Fenton at the uh, Gastro Foundation if you wish, wish to send us uh, cases uh, that you are dealing, dealing with. I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Um, and what we're going to do today is, uh, so today's focus is on patient blood management. And uh, I'm very pleased to say that we have uh, Professor Vernon Lowe, who's head of clinical hematology at Hoteskir and University of Cape Town. And he loves iron metabolism. And he has agreed today to give us a talk on physiology, as well as the diagnosis of iron deficiency anemia. He's also an avid uh, YouTuber. He's got his own YouTube channel. So if you miss some of what he might be saying today, please uh, look for him uh, online. When he has completed his talk, I'm going to immediately go on to a case-based presentation. And then afterwards, uh, we will welcome questions. So the chat function will be open for questions uh, later on uh, in this meeting. I have to say that I'd like to thank the Gastro Foundation for facilitating uh, these sessions, and the aim really is uh, educational. So without much further ado, I'm going to hand over to Professor Lowe, and I look forward uh, to his presentation. Thank you. Mashiku, thank you so much that, that for your very kind introduction, and also a huge thanks to the Gastro Foundation for this invitation. It's already great to see 
a lot of people in the chat room that I know, um, people from my old uh, working place in Bloemfontein, like Ute Holbauer and Jan Duplessis, and I see uh, Elson and Berry, one of my old trainees who's in Zimbabwe. Lovely to see you all. And today we're going to um, really start a series of discussions on aspects of patient blood management. And patient blood management is a very broad topic. And uh, the, the, the idea is today to really focus in on iron physiology on a sort of a more on a high level. And how do you apply that to diagnostics? And I'm going to really try and not make it not overcomplicated because you can do that with, with great ease if you want to. And then I look forward to talk to all of you again in November and in December as well on other topics related to this. And perhaps then we can go a bit deeper and I look forward to having your cases that we can discuss those as well. So for today's meeting, and I must just see that I can get ahead here, we're going to talk about iron metabolism and how we apply that to the testing and diagnosis of iron deficiency. And then Mashiku is going to help us look at how do we work up a patient with iron deficiency. And, and you may think that these things are very obvious, but you know, in reality, there is a lot that I've learned that I thought I knew, but I didn't really. So I hope that there's something new here for everybody. So first thing is, did you know that iron deficiency is the number one health problem in the world. Now that's probably not 100% true. Uh, dental problems seem, seems to be slightly more, more common, but none of us here, I think, are directly involved with, with dental problems. But after dental problems, iron deficiency is number one. And it affects one third of the world population. In South Africa, it's certainly the number one, where it affects up to one out of two women. And it's the number one cause of anemia. 50% of all anemias in the world um, is caused by iron deficiency. And it's certainly the number one most common health problem in pregnancy, although not often recognized as such. So that gives us about 2.3 billion people in the world that suffers from anemia, half of whom have iron deficiency anemia. And as I said, 50% of that is that total of anemia is, is due to iron deficiency. We can see the spread here of all the other conditions as well. It's not only true in general, it's also true in the surgical population where there's a very high prevalence of anemia with associated uh, increased mortality and other, com other morbidity issues. And you can see that 85 84% uh, of surgical anemia is related to iron deficiency, either absolute or iron restriction, and we're going to come back in the physiology to that. This is an example of a study that was done in the Western Cape, showing that 39.8% of all participants were iron deficiency, were iron deficient, and amongst females and black Africans, this went up to 56 and 50.7% respectively. Now, that's literally more than half of the people in the Western Cape, not only from uh, poorer environments from all environments put together that had such a high prevalence of iron deficiency. So what are the major steps in iron metabolism? And we'll zoom in a little bit on the different ones. It's intake, absorption, transport, utilization of the iron, and there may be a surprise waiting for you, recycling, storage, and loss. Those are the seven major steps. There are some other minor steps that I don't think we need to go into today. But I want to run you through this picture quickly. So on the left, and I hope you can see my little cursor there, but on the left is the gut, and you can see the little blue dots represent our iron that has come in through the diet or through, through whatever other means, uh, supplementation. And this iron will have to move through the enterocytes in the duodenum to be transported on transferrin, where eventually it will be taken up by the bone marrow, incorporated into hemoglobin, put into red cells. The red cells will enter the circulation, go around for 120 days more or less, after which these red cells with the iron inside will be recycled in the spleen. Iron will be released from the spleen back into the circulation. Any excess iron will be stored in the liver as ferritin, but I want you to see in the middle of this picture, and this is where 
we're learning a lot these days. Iron is actually uh, not only there for red blood cells. It's really, really critical for every organ in the body. But the heart, the brain, muscle, the developing fetus, the pregnant mother in particular are very sensitive to decreases in, in iron, independent of anemia and independent of the effect on the bone marrow. And we'll come back to some of that. If we look at the key aspect, and I really zoom in here on the enterocyte, this is where the magic happens. And, and this is what you need to understand to understand almost everything about iron and iron physiology. So you take in iron in the Fe3 plus form. Now, how do you remember that Fe3 plus is ferric or ferrous? Well, I always tell the people, you just listen to the sound. What does it sound like? Three. Does that sound like ferric or ferrous? Well, ferric and three, that's the one. And the same with Fe2 plus is like ferrous, ferrous. So that's ferrous iron. And you'll see how this works as we go along. So ferric iron is reduced by an electron being added in the gut before it can be absorbed. Because you see here is this thing called DMT1, divalent metal transferase 1, divalent, meaning it wants something that is 2 plus. So unless it's 2 plus, it won't be able to enter. So it's got to be changed here by this thing called ferric reductase, by this enzyme. And why is this important? Ferrous iron with this extra electron is quite a toxic thing. If you took in ferrous iron in a ferrous form, that would really uh, cause a, a lot of upset in your, in your gut. And that's exactly why people who take ferrous sulfate don't tolerate it. Because this extra electron leads to free radical formation, oxidative stress, and the gut lining doesn't like it. So, at the level of the brush border, Fe3 plus changed into Fe2 plus enters through DMT1 and is this Fe2 plus is deposited in the cell in the middle here as this what we call a labile iron pool. And the same happens on the right, you see heme iron. Again, the Fe2 plus is taken from the heme and is deposited in this pool. But this pool is Fe2 plus, it's very toxic those extra electrons will bind to uh, hydrogen ions, to all sorts of things and cause damage to cell membranes, lysosomes, DNA, mitochondria, etc. So that's not safe. The body doesn't like Fe2+. So what will it do? Three things. It can either store it in ferritin, and you'll see here ferritin is not only present in the liver, it's also present in the enterocyte. And when you lose iron, you lose it through sloughing of these enterocytes. And that's because the iron is sitting in the ferritin there. The second thing that can happen, and this is critically important to understand, is this iron is taken up by the mitochondria. And what do, what do mitochondria do? They make ATP. And there are many, at least five enzymes in the, in the mitochondria that are iron dependent and without which you would not be able to make ATP. Now, this is your first take-home message for, for, for the day. If you don't have enough iron, you cannot make ATP, even if you are not anemic. So in the body, the bone marrow takes the iron first, and all the other organs must line up and wait until the bone marrow has had enough. Because obviously, if you don't have, bloody, if you, if you don't have iron in the bone marrow, you don't have red cells, you can't carry oxygen, you die. So that's the bone marrow gets it first. But if the bone marrow is taken most of it and there's not enough left for the heart, the brain, etc., you can have all the symptoms. Let, let me say that again. All the symptoms of iron deficiency anemia without needing to be anemic, just by being iron deficient. And that's one of the major messages I need to send out there for doctors. Those patient, patients need treatment. Otherwise, they will really feel terrible. So this has led to a concept that we call non-anemic iron deficiency or NAID, which is now widely recognized as a very important cause of morbidity for people. And uh, you, you shouldn't wait until the patient is anemic. 
And these are some of the symptoms that I think many of you know very well, the fatigue, the hair loss, which is very common, headaches, very common, uh, mouth ulcers and sore tongue, not that common, infection, not that common, the pallor, usually when you are anemic, and then the nails that break easily is very common, restless legs. Two thirds of people have pica, and often, note, note that often they have an increased craving for foodstuffs. It doesn't have to be soil or clay or ice or things like that. It could just be things like st starting to eat a bag of tomatoes every day or two whole breads or things like that. So, so a cra an excess craving for sweets or, or, or other foodstuffs can also be an issue. The next point, I said there were three things that could happen with this FE2+. And I want you also to start looking at the words. You can see ferritin. The ferri is like ferric. It's three plus iron sitting inside. So the two plus is changed into three plus and put into this tin, this storage tin, ferritin. Now, the, the last thing, the third thing that can happen with this Fe2 plus iron, it needs to get out into the circulation to be transported. And it goes through this iron door, which is called ferroportin. Port is a door. And the ferro, ferrous, tells you it's two plus. But now you want to carry this 2 plus on transferrene. And transferrene, the ferrine tells you this is a carrier of 3 plus. So the trans transporter of 3 plus iron. So, but it comes out as 2 plus. So you need to do something. And there are two oxidases that changes the Fe2 plus to 3 plus uh, called hephaestin and ceruloplasmin that you'll see again later. But at this level, something critical happens. And this is where the whole control of iron takes place. And that is by this very special molecule that regulates iron absorption that is called hepcidin. Now, again, to remember how hepcidin works and to, to, to help you for, never forget what hepcidin does is if you look at the name, hep is for hep or liver. It's made in the liver. Okay, that's easy. Sidon. What does that sound like? Microbicide, okay? So before we knew that hepcidin or hepcidin, as some people would say, was the key regulator uh, of iron absorption, we also knew that this was killing microbes, okay? But interestingly enough, why would it be killing microbes and control iron absorption? Well, microbes are dependent on iron to survive. So this molecule, hepcin, hepcidin, kills the microbes, plus locks this door, ferroportin. So when the hepcidin levels are high, which happens in infection or inflammation, for instance, ferroportin is internalized and iron cannot be absorbed. So it does two things. It kills the bugs that bug you, plus it doesn't give them food. So they can't be fed with iron because the, the doors are locked and no iron can come in. If hepcidin production is low, then the opposite happens. And this is exactly when you're iron deficient, then um, your hepcidin is going to be low and you'll absorb iron. But if you have a disease like hemochromatosis, there may be a mutation that leads to a low hepcidin. And now you've got excessive iron absorption. And the same if there's inefficient erythropoiesis in the bone marrow, like certain diseases, that will send a signal which will decrease hepcidin production and again you'll overabsorb iron. So if you look at this all you can see here that when hepcidin production is high ferroportin will be low and iron absorption uh, will be low. If it's low the opposite ferroportin is high and iron absorption is increased. Now what does that mean for us practically? If this little black circle is ferroportin you can see it's sitting on the enterocyte, it's on the liver, it's on the macrophages macrophages in the spleen and the macrophages in the bone marrow. So when you have simple iron deficiency, there's not going to be any iron here inside the body. Then the focus is really on this place, on the gut. With simple iron deficiency, this will be low. Ah, the um, the, the um, hepcidin will be low and the ferroportin will be high. So then you can absorb iron. And these patients can have simple oral iron for treatment, not a problem. And I'm going to come back to what happens in the opposite situation later. So let's look at a few
clinical applications. So this, the first step of iron absorption is, of course, to get iron out of, out of the food in the stomach. And for that, you need hydrochloric acid in the gastric fluid to dissolve the iron from the food. And if you think of the pH in the stomach, that's between one and two. That's similar to battery acid. I don't recommend that you put it in your car's battery, but it can actually dissolve stainless steel. It's quite, quite an amazing uh, low pH. So any patient who doesn't have a stomach or who's got an atrophic gastritis, uh, as we see in elderly people who have pernicious anemia, uh, who take PPIs or have had bariatric surgery may be at risk of having a problem with not enough acid to get iron out of their food. And if we look at the Western diet, you'll see that iron absorption is not that great. We take in 10 to 20 milligrams of iron a day. And the heme iron is relatively well absorbed, about 30%, but the inorganic iron found in meat and vegetables very poorly. And in total, you only absorb about 10% of whatever you take in. There are some factors that can increase iron absorption, such as vitamin C. Why? Because it's a reducing agent. It changes the Fe3 plus to Fe2 plus. So you can increase absorption by 50%. By taking in meat, which contains a better absorbed form of iron, of course, you will have better iron levels. What about spinach? I have to mention this because whenever I ask someone uh, or a crowd what is a good source of iron, they tell me spinach, and that is not necessarily true. If you look at this graph, you'll see that spinach contains a lot of iron, but the blue shows you how much is actually absorbed. So how much do you need for your daily needs? So we learned from Popeye that if we eat spinach, we get our iron, but you actually only get 0.044 milligrams per 100 grams of spinach, which translates into, you need to eat between two and four and a half kilo of spinach per day. And I, I wanna see anyone convince their children to do that. I think it's not gonna be easy. But it also means that vegetarians, vegans, and people who have a low meat intake are at greater risk of having iron deficiency. The other thing is to, to remember the effects of your diet on iron absorption. There's a lot of things in our food that can actually bind to the iron and block absorption. For instance, in cereals, you could have phosphates, stannates, and phytates. In milk, uh, you can, or other beverages, there's calcium, there's phosphatin in eggs. There's the polyphenols in tea and coffee, and all of these will block iron absorption. And that's why the older formulation of iron, uh, like uh, an older formulation like ferrous sulfate, needs to be taken on an empty stomach. Otherwise, it will bind to all these things and not be absorbed, especially with breakfast. You can see there's a lot of breakfast foods in there. So that doesn't mean you cannot drink tea and coffee. It just means that you shouldn't drink tea and coffee with your iron. Keep it for tea time and keep your iron at least two hours away from that. Of course, if there's a problem with the gut itself, with a lining like celiac disease or inflammatory bowel disease, there's going to be problems with absorption. And to take an example, such as inflammation, like in ulcerative colitis or Crohn's, or cancer, heart failure, surgery, any of those conditions will lead to an increase in hepcidin shown here in this little H. And that will block ferroportin. And then iron cannot be absorbed, nor can it be recycled from the spleen, from the macrophages. It can't be, you can't get the iron out of the stores in the liver, nor out of the macrophages in the bone marrow. So all the organs will be starved of iron. And the patient even if they've got a lot of iron in their stores or stuck in their ma macrophages, they will, have, they will not have enough iron available to actually uh, suit the needs of their organs. And that's what we call iron restriction. And that's also what you see in anemia of chronic disease, now called anemia of inflammation. It's the high hepcidin that blocks up all the doors and the iron is not available. It also means that when your hepcidin is, is high, your oral iron absorption is going to be blocked. And this can often confuse people because if you now do a patient's iron studies, what will you see? The serum iron will be low. Any 
because there's no iron able to come in. And that doesn't mean that it's, it's a simple iron deficiency. The ferritin is going to be high because it's an acute phase reactant. And we need to figure out how to interpret this. And I'll show you that in a moment. So in these cases, obviously, you need something different, like intravenous iron or another formulation of iron that can bypass uh, the hepcidin pathway. So how do we lose iron? Well, usually through desquamation of the cells in the gut. And then in menstruating females, there's an additional 16 milligrams lost during normal menstruation. Uh, in total, they lose about 40 to 60 milligrams a month. Um, and Mashika will speak more about this. But if you have iron deficiency in patients over 50, you have to find a cause usually in the, gut, in the gut or gynecological. Don't forget the other causes of menstrual blood loss, hemorrhagia, postpartum hemorrhage, frequent blood donation. I saw a patient today that has donated more than 100 units of blood that was iron deficient. So don't forget to take that in the history. And certainly a poor diet is going to cause a problem. Heavy menstrual bleeding, we should not underestimate. It affects a third to half of all adolescents. One out of three will visit their GP in a three-year period for this. And one out of 20, that's 5% of teenagers, will end up in ICU with severe iron deficiency anemia. And of course, pregnancy, prematurity, and growth are key times. And I hope to speak to you at some point just about pregnancy because it's a passion of mine. And pregnancy and iron deficiency is really, really important. So how do we diagnose this condition? So, so as medical students, we are taught that the classical lab findings of iron deficiency is a microcytosis, hypochromia with a low MCV and MCH, a low ferritin, and decreased bone marrow iron stores. But this is really, really not telling the whole story. What you're learning about here is end-stage iron deficiency anemia. If you look at it more carefully, there are actually three stages. There's a first stage that we call iron depletion with non-anemic iron deficiency. So here the serum iron can be low, the ferritin is low and the iron stores are low or absent, but the patients are not yet anemic. But note, they can have all the symptoms. In stage two, the patient may start to have a normocytic anemia. Note, not hypochromic microcytic. This is early iron deficiency. They have all the symptoms. Only in stage three, will they have, start having the other features, an increased RDW, microcytic hypochromic anemia, and then the visi visible physical features, glossitis, stomatitis, you know, coilonychia, et cetera. So remember, this, the, many people are, are in the first two stages, very symptomatic, and you need to diagnose them. And how do we do that? Well, the major diagnostic test that I use in 99.9% .9 of patients is the transferrin saturation, and the serum ferritin. The transferrin saturation reflects iron available for red cell production and other tissues. And we say it's low if less than 20%. And the ferritin reflects iron stores. So let's look at the, uh, the transferrin saturation for a moment. So you may have heard of something called total iron binding capacity. And I want to quickly explain this because um, this is often misunderstood. So if you see, if these are the, the five little canoes with their two seats each represent five transferrin molecules. You can see each of them has got two seats on which iron can sit. So what is the iron binding capacity of this transport system? Well, how many seats are there? How many iron can be carried? It's 10. So let's say there are, how many ions are sitting on the seats? Four. So what? is the transferrin saturation. I know this is simplified, but it's good enough and it works for me every day. So if your serum iron is four, your iron binding capacity is 10, your SATs is 40%. That's normal. If the iron was one, it's 10%. That's low. So transferrin saturation less than 20% is low. And the causes would be iron deficiency, it could be inflammation, it could be iron deficiency plus inflammation. And, and we'll look at a few things to, to help us differentiate between these. And I'm going to keep it simple today so that we don't get confused. So let's start with how we use this. Let's just 
go to the ferritin first. So you'll find that we said that ferritin is this intracellular iron storage protein. And this is a nice slide I, I adapted from one of our fellows, Dr. Perry Lubenberg, who I think is in the audience as well. Um, if you use a ferritin cutoff of less than 15, which to my great upset and disapproval is the lower cutoff point that, are you, that is used by most labs. This has only got a sensitivity of 57%, which means that you will miss 43% of cases. Yes, you can be 99% sure that this is really iron deficiency and not vitamin C deficiency, which is the other 1%, but you're missing 43%, which is just, in my opinion, unacceptable. So all the current guidelines, and I'm saying literally all the current guidelines that are published in 2020 beyond, probably the last five years, will tell you that if a ferritin is less than 30, that is iron deficiency. Now you only miss 8% of cases and you've got a specificity of 98% and still the only other cause is, is vitamin C deficiency. And if that is not a problem, if, if, if you're uncertain, just tell the patient to eat some oranges or drink some orange juice or something. But um, that will even increase their iron absorption. So these patients will all be treated with iron if their ferritin is less than 30. Now, because ferritin is an acute phase reactant, it's a problem in the elderly, in patients with HIV, patients with liver disease, infection, inflammation, tissue damage, heart disease, cancer, ulcerative colitis, you name it. So what do you do now? Well, if your ferritin is 30 to 100, now we're trying to find the other 8%. You remember? If a, if a ferritin is above 30, between 30 and 100, but your transferrin saturation is less than 20%, you don't have to do anything further. That's iron deficiency. Okay, anemia if there's a low HP as well. If the HP is normal, that's iron deficiency, you must treat. But if you have conditions like heart failure, then the ferritin, you can allow a ferritin up to 300. If the TF sats is less than 20%, that is iron deficiency and must be treated. And the latest European, uh, Euro European Cardiology Association guidelines actually states this exactly. So the problem that we often face is that we, do, we only do a ferritin. And then we see a ferritin of 300 and we think everything is fine. Not if the patient has heart failure. And if a patient has chronic kidney disease, look at that, 500. And the sets up to 30%. These patients are given IV iron, usually with erythropoietin. So let's quickly summarize. If your ferritin is less than 30, if there's anemia, that's iron deficiency anemia, you treat. If the ferritin is 30 to 100, transferrin saturation less than 20, that could be anemia of chronic inflammation with iron deficiency, you treat. If the ferritin is, is uh, more than 100, the transferrin saturation is less than 20 and there's a very high CRP, it's more difficult. That patient uh, may need further tests like reticulocyte hemoglobin content, um, et cetera, et cetera. Not that easy, unless it's a patient with heart failure or kidney failure, as we have shown. So in conclusion, iron deficiency is the most common health problem in the world. Every cell in your body needs it. You, ATP is your energy source. Without it, you can't twitch a muscle. You can have all the symptoms of iron deficiency anemia without being anemic, just with iron deficiency. And anemia is the end stage. Good doctors try to avoid the end stage. We treat patients early. So you have to find a cause. And then, I, as I said, I look forward to talking to you about pregnancy because that will blow your mind to hear all the effects of, of iron on the developing brain of a baby during pregnancy. It's really amazing. And, and maybe if the um, kind people from the Gastro Foundation allows me, then I'll talk about that in one of our next sessions. So with that, I want to hand over to my colleague um, to Mashiko and ask her to talk to us about how to find the underlying cause. Thanks, Mashiko. Thank you so much for an excellent and clear presentation. This topic can cause a lot of confusion and I think repeated you know, revisions on it uh, certainly helps uh, clinicians uh, in, terms, in terms of framing how they think about this condition. 
So thank you so much for that. I really appreciate it. Um, as I said earlier, um, we will take questions at the end of my talk. Um, the chat will be open shortly. So uh, please feel free to, to post your questions for both uh, Venon and I. So I'm going to sh share my screen. And actually uh, what Vernon did was actually um, form a nice uh, foundation uh, for me to take up my discussion on basically how we as gastroenterologists will then investigate the patient referred to us with iron deficiency anemia. So what exactly do we do? And the first thing is really to confirm or document the iron deficiency anemia. As Vernon has shown, we need to be able to exclude non-GI causes and then for us specifically, we look for GIT factors or risk factors that might be important uh, in the patient's presentation. Endoscopy is our bread and butter. It's really important for us in terms of investigations and even therapy. And then of course the patient uh, needs uh, to be treated for their iron deficiency. So I think this uh, talk is timely because um, there've been a lot of controversy uh, in the various guidelines of the various societies as to A, how we define iron deficiency anemia, how we investigate, in which order we should do our endoscopic investigations, uh, and what other allied investigations should one do. And this guideline, which is from the American Gastroenterology uh, Association, was actually released in mid-September this year, and it tries to answer some of those controversies uh, C's that exist uh, in the literature. So I refer you please to read uh, this particular document. There are other guidelines uh, from the BSG, the NICE guidelines, and there are some differences between this AGA guideline as well as the BSG and the NICE. Um, but this one is the most recent uh, iteration of the guidelines. Uh, and in fact, I'm gonna base uh, the rest of my talk uh, on the recommendations uh, in this guideline. So, but uh, before we get into it, I don't want to do all the work by myself. May I please ask you to participate in the poll? We're only going to put it up for 30 seconds. So please uh, think quickly and on your feet. And if you will, uh, would you please answer the first question? What cut of value for ferritin do you use in your institution or where you're based to diagnose iron deficiency anemia? Is it 15, 30, or 45? Mashika? Yeah. Little, yeah. Sorry, I can't get the poll up. Do you, could we just move on? Okay, all right, that's fine. Are you, are you gonna have the same problem for the remaining questions or is it just for this one? It looks like it, it says I'm inactive for the poll. Okay, and it's not possible to make me host or co-host to see if I can do the poll. I can, I'm gonna, I can do that. Okay, all right, well, while we try to, to figure that out, then I'll just move on. Um, so you will have heard from Prof Lowe that uh, the guidelines are all sort of in agreement that uh, less than 30 maximizes your sensitivity while actually minimizing the number of patients that would be missed. Now, interestingly, for gastroenterology, that uh, threshold has been revised to 45. The reason being that if you consider that the tests that we do, the endoscopic procedures that we do are invasive, if you try and balance that against the risk of missing patients and therefore uh, misdiagnosing people, then in terms of uh, cost effectiveness, value and safety for patients, a threshold of 45 will capture most patients um, that uh, have iron deficiency anemia while not exposing those that don't need to be investigated um, to the invasive procedures. So the first recommendation from this particular guideline is that the threshold of 45 should be used over 15 or 30 when using ferritin uh, to diagnosis. And it was a strong recommendation based on high quality evidence. So Prof Lo, I'm afraid I have to um, disagree with you there. We gastroenterologists prefer that higher uh, threshold. So when we see the patient, in addition to documenting and confirming the iron deficiency anemia, then the next thing is to make sure that the patient in fact does not have non-GI sources of bleeding. And Prof Lo has gone into them, but of course, blood donation. Ah, I see the poll has gone up. Um, I think we still have time to answer that, please. Although now I've told you the answer. <laughs> so I think I'm, I'm, uh, I'm gonna end the poll. It looks like most people were going for 30. Which, which is on the window? 
Uh, sorry to interrupt you. I'm just running the poll. Just let me know when to end it. Uh, you can end it. Thank you so much. Okay. Yeah. And yeah, so most people were going with 30, which is exactly what Prof. Lowe told you. But uh, as I'm saying, from our point of view as gastroenterologists, uh, 45 is evidence-based uh, in terms of minimizing uh, risk uh, of endoscopic procedures. Um, you can close the poll. Thank you. So yeah, the next thing is to rule out uh, non-GI causes of bleeding. As Prof. said, menses, uh, epistaxis, diet is super important. Uh, medications that might impair absorption. Obviously, patients who've had trauma, but those are likely to present with overt bleeding. Um, patients who've had recent surgery similarly might have um, complications post-op, which, uh, which might cause them to, to present with uh, anemia. An area that is often missed is that urinary tract tumors uh, tend to present uh, with anemia, so those need to be ruled out, and uh, patients with hematopathies. Once these are ruled out, then we are more or less certain that uh, the, the cause is most likely going to be uh, in the gut. And for us, what is important is the age of the person. The older the patient gets, the higher the chances of lesions uh, that may predispose them to having a chronic uh, blood loss, uh, uh, cancer, inflammatory conditions, and other conditions, angiodysplastic lesions. Gender is important. So obviously, in women of childbearing age, it is accepted that uh, people people um, who might have anemia from menses, but important uh, are women uh, in the postmenopausal uh, group who should not have anemia. There's absolutely no reason for that. And then the guidelines do address uh, pre-menopausal women between the ages of 40 and 50. It's important also to assess patients for additional symptoms. Most of the patients that are referred are asymptomatic, but obviously if the patient has got, have got other GIT symptoms, that might point you as to the, the, the source uh, or the area of the gut that might be contributing to the anemia. Important to get a family history of colorectal cancer, of autoimmune disorders, or even um, personal history from the patient, history of malabsorption, previous H. pylori infection, whether it was eradicated successfully or not. Personal history of um, GI surgery. So we're talking about gastrectomies, we're talking about uh, gastric bypass surgery, and those kinds of surgeries which might predispose a patient uh, to iron deficiency anemia. Uh, and then medications. So uh, NSAIDs, uh, aspirin. In our population, there's a high usage of grandpa and other um, NSAIDs, uh, the use of uh, PPI, anticoagulations. All these um, might uh, predispose the patient uh, to bleeding risk and uh, mucosal lesions uh, throughout the gut. So that history is quite important. Now. The people that have been addressed uh, in the guideline that I've referred to are strictly people with asymptomatic uh, iron deficiency anemia. So it does exclude people with symptomatic disease, for instance, patients with overt bleeding, whether it's hematemesis, malina, or frank PR bleeding. Those patients clearly need to be investigated according to the manner in which they've presented. And, and even the sequence of investigations will be dictated to by the presentation. The guideline does not uh, address patients who have iron deficiency but no anemia. It does not uh, address patients who have refractory uh, or recurrent um, iron deficiency anemia. And in this context, um, it might be important to collaborate with hematologists if patients uh, have recurrent or refractory iron deficiency anemia. And it doesn't address patients who have obscure GI bleeding. So these are the patients who have anemia, um, uh, due to bleeding, but uh, our investigations cannot reveal where the source uh, of the bleeding is. So it is strictly really referring to patients who present with asymptomatic iron deficiency anemia, who tend to be the majority of patients uh, uh, that are referred to as for anemia. So the gut is an important source of chronic blood loss from the mucosa and any lesion really uh, which causes breaches uh, in the mucosa can bleed uh, chronically for gut diseases, uh, common ones, uh, erosive esophagitis, uh, peptic ulcer disease, um, dulafoy lesions, which can bleed, um, and then colitis. I mean, often these patients will have symptoms, but you might have a patient who's mildly symptomatic or asymptomatic, who presents with anemia and is uh, diagnosed uh, with colitis. Colon cancer can be quite um, insidious, and the patient's uh, first presentation might be with iron deficiency anemia, uh, even polyps. 
So the gut is an area to certainly look uh, for causes uh, of uh, iron deficiency anemia that are not explained by diseases outside of the gut. And indeed, uh, other than abnormal uterine bleeding and 1% of patients who have hematuria, more than two thirds of patients will have pathology in the gut and hence uh, referral to a gastroenterologist and uh, endoscopy are mandatory in the investigation and management of these patients. What has not been addressed uh, in the guideline is what you do with patients uh, in whom you do a gastroscopy and you find ulcers or esophagitis or gastritis, whether that is sufficient to say that this would explain the anemia or whether you should go on and do uh, lower GI studies. So the NICE guidelines do say that you should not accept that as sufficient reason for the iron deficiency anemia and therefore you should go on and investigate the patient uh, for lower GI pathology. This particular guideline does not uh, make any declarations about that particular situation. So if we can share the second question, please, uh, on the poll. Uh, in terms of gastroscopy, I mean endoscopy, what procedure or procedures would you perform? Would you do a gastroscopy first? Would you do a colonoscopy first? Would you do a gastroscopy followed by colonoscopy on the same day? Or would you do a gastroscopy followed by colonoscopy on another day? Thank you so much for the responses. I really appreciate the interaction. Excellent. So about 60% will do a gastroscopy followed by colonoscopy in the same setting. And uh, a third will do gastroscopy and colonoscopy on different days. And about 16% uh, of you would do a gastroscopy first. It's encouraging to see that uh, no one would do a colonoscopy first. So indeed, I think uh, that's correct. So I'm going to stop sharing the results. And if you look at the recommendation, the recommendation is that you should do bi-directional endoscopy. So that is top and bottom in men, all men, irrespective of their age and in postmenopausal women. And uh, the guidelines suggest that you should do it in the same setting. The guideline does say that for premenopausal women that uh, you should do bi-directional endoscopy. However, in a patient who is not concerned about the possibility of there being a non-benign lesion who at the same time is concerned about the risk of the invasiveness of the procedures, you might give iron therapy and then monitor the patient. However, in a patient who's quite uh, happy to undergo uh, investigations, who's premenopausal, then they do suggest a bidirectional endoscopy. The BSG guidelines suggest that in a premenopausal woman, one should give iron therapy first before uh, subjecting the patient uh, to uh, endoscopy. Um, so the guidelines, again, um, don't uh, account for a situation where, or they, they don't give options as to if you cannot do the procedure in the same setting, can you do gastroscopy first followed by colonoscopy? And if so, what time interval uh, should, should, should there be between the two procedures? Uh, that is not addressed. I know that in our setting, it's not always possible to actually schedule them on the same day. And in fact, there are some clinicians uh, who feel that you first do the gastroscopy and depending on what you find, treat what you find. And if the patient has persistent uh, anemia, then a colonoscopy is indicated. I'd be interested to find out what, uh, what the people on the call uh, feel about this and, and what they do uh, in real term. So the third question is, when you do do the gastroscopy, do you routinely biopsy for H. pylori infection, even if there's no gastritis or duodenitis? Thanks, we can stop the poll and share the results. So 80% of you would uh, actually um, routinely biopsy uh, the mucosa for H. pylori. So this is something again that the guideline doesn't directly address. So they suggest and they recommend that in patients with iron deficiency anemia, 
without any identifiable etiology, one should do non-invasive testing for H. pylori, followed by treatment over no testing. So this guideline assumes that uh, people have access to non-invasive tests uh, for H. pylori. So the urea breath test, the stool antigen test, and so forth. And it would be, I'd be curious to find out how many people on the call actually have that um, opportunity to do non-invasive testing, because I suspect, given your responses, that actually you don't have access to non-invasive tests. Hence, you do uh, opportunistic uh, uh, biopsies uh, at the time that you do the gastroscopy, because clearly it wouldn't be cost effective to do the, the gastroscopy, uh, looking for uh, causes of the anemia and not biopsy, uh, and then come back just to do the biopsies for H. pylori uh, because the patient is refractory uh, to, to iron therapy. So I think in, in, our, in our setting, it does make sense that people would do the biopsies at that first um, uh, gastroscopy. Uh, for, for, for the non-GIT uh, folk on the call, um, there is an association between uh, iron deficiency and H. pylori, and that's because H. pylori causes uh, antral uh, predominant gastritis, and sometimes with treatment can migrate to involve the entire um, uh, lining of the stomach. And then you get A. chloridia, and uh, for that reason, then you can get uh, um, uh, iron deficiency because you need um, hydrochlor um, H plus uh, for absorption uh, of iron. So this is the mechanism by which uh, H. pylori is associated with iron deficiency anemia. And therefore, by extension, the, the feeling is that if a patient has H. pylori and is iron deficient, if you treat the H. pylori infection, the um, iron deficiency anemia should resolve. So in the same uh, vein, uh, if patients have gotten atrophic gastritis on the basis of an autoimmune disorder uh, of the tummy, again, the uh, AGA recommends against routine biopsies looking for atrophic gastritis. Uh, again, they, they, they say that you'd rather do non-invasive tests with antiparietal cell antibodies, et cetera. Again, it assumes that people have access to those uh, non-invasive tests, but I suspect um, that as before, people would do biopsies uh, when they do do their gastroscopy. Question four is, do you routinely test for celiac disease when investigating IDA? Yes, no, huh? It's okay, can we please move on to the next question in the poll? We're not gonna do this one. Uh, move on to the next question in the poll. I decided to leave these two out uh, in the interest of time. Thank you. It's it's just over half and half. It's fine. Uh, you can please end the poll and share the results. So just uh, about half and half would do uh, routine biopsies, uh, duodenal biopsies for celiac disease. So the recommendation from the AGA is that in asymptomatic adult patients with iron deficiency anemia and plausible celiac disease, so based on history only, um, one should not do uh, routine uh, duodenal uh, biopsies, but again, should start with non-invasive tests uh, for serologic uh, testing of uh, celiac disease, and only if positive, um, then one should treat. Um, if, only pos if it's positive, then one can do uh, uh, biopsies, which is what we would do for any patient who presents with typical symptoms of um, uh, celiac disease. The point here is that patients with celiac disease may be asymptomatic and may present only with iron deficiency anemia and not the other typical GIT symptoms. I think that's the first thing to remember. So in patients in, uh, with iron deficiency anemia, where you've looked for other causes and it's not clear what the cause is, one should test uh, for a celiac disease non-invasively if possible. The only caveat to this is if you're dealing with a patient who already gives you a history of uh, autoimmune disorders, so thyroiditis, type 1 diabetes, somebody in whom you've treated the iron deficiency anemia but is refractory to treatment, then you can, and the um, non-invasive tests are, are negative for celiac disease, 
then you can go on and do duodenal biopsies. And then also in people where um, the duodenal mucosa looks abnormal when you do your gastroscopy. In that case, you have to biopsy anyway. And finally, in populations where the prevalence of celiac disease is greater than 5%, this is the only time that uh, they recommend that you can biopsy even without non-invasive testing. But for the average patient who presents asymptomatically, who doesn't have a history, a strong family history, where the duodenal mucosa appears normal, and is somebody who's responding to iron therapy, they recommend against routine biopsies of the duodenum. So what we do is that once you've done the uh, gastroscopy, um, then you uh, will treat, uh, and then you will schedule the patient uh, for a colonoscopy. And the importance of a colonoscopy is obviously in um, the fact that you can make diagnoses uh, with angiodysplastic lesions uh, shown here. Patients may present with cancer, with anemia, without any other symptoms. And also patients can have polyps. You might not see that polyp, uh, but I've highlighted there. And the advantage of colonoscopy is that other than a diagnosis, then one obviously can uh, do therapy in the same setting. So here what we do is that we lift the polyp up with a solution that contains a dye so that we can see where we are as well as adrenaline, which is important for vasoconstricting the blood vessel so that when you cut the polyp, it doesn't bleed. And then we use a snare, it's a polypectin snare, uh, snare, then we ensnare the lesion and then we can cut it and coagulate it off. So in the same setting, you can make the diagnosis these we can uh, coagulate uh, with argon plasma coagulation, polyps we can remove, um, cancer we can biopsy, and uh, we normally uh, work very closely with our uh, colorectal surgeons. So we can call them into the room and uh, they can assess uh, where the cancer is and further tests that need to be done in terms of staging the patient. So colonoscopy is exceptionally useful uh, in the diagnosis and management of these patients. So this is the second last question. If the gastroscopy and colonoscopy are normal, what would you do next? Would you do a capsule endoscopy? Would you go on and do a double balloon endoscopy? So to assess the small bowel, so you've assessed the foregut and the, um, the colon. Um, so the double balloon would be useful for examining the small bowel. Would you do iron therapy or would you do imaging? Got a very active audience. This is fantastic. All right, please end the poll and share the results. Thank you so much. So as you can see, um, nobody would, a few people would do a double balloon. So the double balloon would only be useful if you've already um, imaged uh, in one way or another, uh, the small bowel and actually there is a lesion and you're using the double balloon to actually intervene, which is either argon or whether removing the polyp. So it's not something that you would do immediately. You'd need something else prior to that to direct you to where the lesion is in the small bowel. So that's for intervention. Um, iron therapy is reasonable and acceptable as is capsule and few people uh, would do MRI CT. Thank you for that. So the uh, AGA recommends that in patients who present with uncomplicated asymptomatic uh, disease, where you haven't found a source of bleeding in your gastroscopy as well as your colonoscopy, and you have done non-invasive tests to exclude celiac disease, uh, H. pylori, and if there was H. pylori, you have treated uh, the H. pylori and have confirmed eradication, then a trial of iron supplementation is reasonable before you do routine evaluation of the small bowel. So I think most of you um, were in line uh, with this guideline. And the reason for this is that BCE, uh, capsule endoscopy is expensive. It's not readily available. And also there's been a lot of controversy about the yield of uh, uh, capsule endoscopy in patients who present uh, with anemia, but without GIT bleeding. And so it is reasonable to first treat the patient uh, with iron therapy. And only if you have a patient who does not respond or gets recurrent uh, uh, iron deficiency anemia, or in fact, subsequently presents with a bleed or something like that, then is a capsule uh, recommended. So for those of you who don't know what capsule endoscopy is, so it's video capsule endoscopy, VCE, is basically a pill, the size just slightly larger than a big tablet, which a patient can swallow. And it has um, 
antenna, it has battery, it has light, and so the patient ingests it with water and it runs through um, the, the gut from the anus all the way from the mouth to the anus. It takes about 10 to 14 hours to transverse through and the patient readily passes it unless there are areas of obstruction where it can get stuck. Um, then the patient is attached to a data recorder with sensors and then the information is captured and can be um, assessed uh, on, on a computer uh, later on for lesions. So it does basically an endoscopy underwater. You can see the villi beautifully and it uh, beautifully delineates a small bowel disease um, um, and then afterwards, then you can go with a double balloon endoscopy uh, in order for, for, to, to do the required uh, therapies. There have been newer iterations of VCE on the market with longer battery lives, uh, which take more pictures per second. It takes about two to three pictures uh, per second as it transverses through. And you can see all manner of uh, pathology, which might explain the iron deficiency. So here you see angiodysplastic lesions, uh, and you can see hookworm inf infection and, and uh, Crohn's disease, which was not uh, apparent uh, with the other diagnostic tests. So the evidence for VCE is there, but only um, if patients have refractory disease that doesn't respond to therapy. Um, um, the other reason that you might use it is in a patient who's a vascular path or a, cardio, a cardiac patient who might require anticoagulation. And you just want to make sure that there are no lesions that would, be, uh, um, that would have a high propensity to bleeding uh, if there were angiodysplastic lesions uh, in the small bowel. So those are the uh, patients that uh, we would do it uh, on. These things that I've listed here for iron deficiency anemia have not been tested. There's no data, they've not been validated. The BSG guidelines, however, say, um, if uh, you don't have colonoscopy, then you could do a virtual colonography uh, to assess patients uh, with IDA. This report is one of our patients. You're not really meant to read it. It's very small, um, a small uh, font. But I wanted to show is the complexity of, of the guidelines and the complexity of the patients that we've managed. So here you've got a 70 year, one, a 71 year old female who uh, is referred to as with iron deficiency anemia. She had H. pylori positive uh, gastritis, which was eradicated. The guideline doesn't address whether you eradicate and then wait and see uh, if the patient uh, uh, is able to have her iron uh, stores repleted before you do colonoscopy. But you can see that in this patient, she went on to have a colonoscopy which showed a sessile polyp. That could have been another reason to explain her uh, iron deficiency. And then we subsequently did do a, a capsule and the capsule showed that she had angiodysplastic lesions in the small bowel. So here you can see a classic case of a, a patient who's got multiple pathologies in multiple areas of the gut, all of which could have contributed to the iron deficiency anemia. So I think the guideline um, is correct in saying that um, you really should do bi-directional endoscopy and even consider um, uh, assessment of the small bowel because of patients like this. So just to summarize what I've said, you need to document your iron deficiency anemia. And I've said the threshold for us gastroenterologists is 45, not 30. You need to do a bi-directional endoscopy in the same setting, ideally in men particularly and postmenopausal women. And in premenopausal women, you need to have a discussion about the risks of missing a lesion uh, versus uh, that of the invasive nature of the procedure. If a patient has got GIT symptoms, the diagnostic evaluation will be dictated by what the patient presents. So it might be necessary if a patient has a bleed or diarrhea to start with a colonoscopy before a uh, gastroscopy. But this is not the patient that I'm discussing today. Today I'm discussing an asymptomatic patient with iron deficiency anemia. Please do non-invasive tests for H. pylori, celiac disease, atrophic uh, gastritis uh, due to autoimmune uh, gastritis and treat accordingly. Um, and then finally, in patients who have um, normal bi-directional endoscopy and normal non-invasive tests, first a trial of iron supplementation. In the majority of patients, this will do the trick and then uh, capsule uh, if necessary. The guideline finally also doesn't address a repeat gastroscopy and colonoscopy because there is also um, a high proportion of, of, of um, procedures where lesions are missed. And you find that on the second gastroscopy or on the second colonoscopy, you find lesions that were not detected uh, before. So it might be worth repeating the bi-directional assessment uh, before actually um, subjecting the patient uh, to a capsule. I'm going to stop there and I hope uh, we will have lots of questions and lots of discussion. We are out of time, but um, I think uh, this is an important topic 
and uh, we have been given permission to run over uh, if necessary. Um, Vernon, did you see any questions uh, in the chat box um, that were directed to you or things that you might want mm. to add? Mashiko, yes, there's, there are quite a few. Just a quick comment. Uh, I'm very interested to go and read your paper in detail, which I see has been published uh, a month ago. So that sounds very interesting. The hematology, the latest hematology blood paper still goes for 30. Yeah. But that doesn't really matter. I think um, by using 45, um, the, 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 I think I guess they've done it based on, on looking at different studies, but you will you could make it cheaper to diagnose iron deficiency because you wouldn't have to do a transferrin saturation on all those, you know, you, you may save some money there. But nevertheless, um, yeah. there, there, there are some differences between different guidelines like cardiology, nephrology, and as we see today, uh, gastroenterology. So that's great. Thank you for, for, for pointing that out and, and, and showing that as well. So there was a question, I think an important one, uh, which is actually for you, Quantitative fecal um, you know, immunochemistry testing is increasingly used to triage for colonoscopy to increase the yield. Yeah. Um, do you... So that's an important question. And, and that has been tested for patients presenting with bleeding. But in patients with anemia, it has not been validated and there's no data for it. Okay. So, yeah. Then there's a question uh, that was from the Gastro Foundation. Then there's a question from Onesai Chihaka. There's iron restriction in infection. Would iron supplementation in the setting of infection worsen infection? It's a very good question. It's a question that comes up almost every time. And uh, on his side, the, the, the answer is nobody really knows exactly. And I'll tell you why. Um, the first thing is it, it depends on what you mean by infection. So in the setting of mal malaria, one of the ways to protect you against malaria is actually to restrict iron, get iron out of the red cells, um, have low iron levels inside red cells, and that actually helps protect you. So if you're in a high, high risk malaria area, then you would, people would often treat the iron deficiency and sometimes even treat for malaria because you've, you can increase the risk for malaria or, or worse malaria in that setting. In the general setting, there's controversial um, ideas about this. Some people would be worried about worsening infection if you give intravenous iron in a patient with an acute infection. Mm. Um, I have taken a personal stance to not treat patient, patients with IV iron who are severely ill with infection like patients in ICU until the infection is under control and only then give the intravenous iron because often in those cases the hepcidin levels are high patient cannot absorb oral iron anyway so then I wouldn't give it but there is a, a meta-analysis looking at more than 10,000 patients where they found no difference in iron rates uh, in infection rates um, whether you give iron or not but I still play it safe and in a severe infection I do not give then uh, there's a question from Ute Holbauer. Ute is a pediatrician with special interest in diabetes and TB in, in the Free State and a good friend of mine. She says, is there any research in children on spacing iron supplementation or treatment? And how much iron absorption is blocked if the syrup is given BD or even TB, TDS? And that connects with a question by Igembe Nkandala and by Johan Potgieter about the dosing of iron. So what while... Is while Mashiko was speaking, I thought I, well, I just quickly opened uh, a slide on another presentation that I think could be useful. So maybe I can just show you this one slide. I'm just going to share my screen because I think you may, this may be helpful. So why, where does this question come from? It's from this study published in the Lancet, Hematology, where they looked at iron absorption from oral iron supplements given on consecutive days, i.e. once daily versus every second day. And there was another part of the study, two studies published in one paper, by the way, where they gave single morning, morning doses versus BD. And what did they find? They found basically that the patients who got every second day, Monday, Wednesday, Friday versus daily, had a better or similar response with less side effects. And the reason for this is that ferrous sulfate, as I showed earlier, increases in, causes an inflammatory response, 
leads to a subsequent increase in hepcidin and your iron absorption is, is blocked for the next 48 hours often. The second study where they looked at twice daily versus daily, again, the daily did better than twice daily or at least the same. So in adults, we now give iron, ferrous sulfate, if you do maintenance, one to one tablet every second day, if you're treating, maybe two tablets, but you give them all at once on one occasion, Monday, Wednesday, Friday. The, there are some specific ions like sucrosomyl iron that can give, still be given daily because it's absorbed independent of hepcidin. And then just specific to pedi pediatrics, and I'm not a pediatrician, but I've looked at the data. It, it's, the current recommendations is to use it daily. There's, mm. there's nothing to say alternate days because we don't have any studies, yeah. but um, it's not BD. So we rather give it daily for the same, same reasons. That's, that's how I understand the, the pediatric literature. Yeah, we also give for the IBD patients, we give um, one tablet daily. And I wonder what your thoughts are that uh, we tend to add vitamin C, but actually my understanding is that there's no evidence that uh, vitamin C improves the absorption of iron. What, what are your thoughts? Well, uh, the way I see the evidence is that um, vitamin C does increase absorption by 50%, but that doesn't have to be vitamin C as in ascorbic acid. It could just be, they say like a, a third of a glass of orange juice is enough. So it's a little bit of orange juice that you take with your with your iron could increase because it, it increases that reduction from three plus to two plus. Yeah. But it can sometimes increase the side effects. That's interesting of vitamin C. They can sometimes have more diarrhea. Um, so there's a there's a question for you here, um, Mashiku. How common is celiac disease in Hrutaskir patient population? That is a million dollar question. So um, we do have a PhD um, student who's trying to figure that out. Okay. We, we, it seems to be low, but uh, when, when he started his project, um, but I think it might be surprisingly more common than what we thought. Uh, yeah. So yeah, he, he, he's, he's looking at national data and uh, hopefully we'll have something to report on that. Great, thank you. And there's another question for you from uh, Prof. Johan Potgitter from Pretoria. What about, uh, he's also a hematologist, Mashiku. Uh, what about labeled red cell studies to find the bleeding source? Yeah, so again, most of these studies have been evaluated for patients who present uh, with their gastrointestinal bleeding and not so much patients uh, with anemia. So in this particular guideline, that is not mentioned at all. In other guidelines, uh, it is barely mentioned. So it might be something that you use as an alternative test if that's the only thing that you have at your center. So let's just say you've, you've done the G-scope and the colonoscopy and the patient still has anemia without overt bleeding. You could do that uh, if that's the only thing that you have and uh, have no other way to assess uh, the small bowel. Great, thank you very much. And then there's a question from our own Perry Lubenberg from uh, Cape Town. Can you miss angiodysplasia in patients with significant anemia? If so, would you repeat the endoscopy once anemia is resolved? So can you miss angiodysplasia in patients with significant? Absolutely. So I think, as I said at the end, in fact, we tend to do repeated uh, gastroscopy and colonoscopy before a capsule, because often you find that there were missed lesions in the duodenum. Uh, and uh, the first time at colonoscopy, it wasn't possible to intubate the terminal ileum, which is critical. So we, we do find that there's sometimes sufficient reason to go back and redo it. And also um, when patients are referred uh, from St. Elsewhere, we tend to want to do the gastroscopy and colonoscopy ourselves. So often you find that the patient has had two or three sort of um, uh, procedures each uh, before a capsule. Great, thank you. And then there's a question also for you. If you have a patient with ongoing iron deficiency anemia after IV iron who had a normal GNC scope, Celiac disease, H. pylori excluded, how often do you repeat scopes? I think as the clinical indication, uh, so if the patient is uh, refractory to therapy uh, and they are in extremis and they have cardiovascular compromise and so forth, then we keep looking. But if you have a patient who's stable, even with a lowish HP, we tend to wait until the next presentation, either of bleeding or of a drop uh, in the HP. 
Mm. So it's it's a balance, you know. There's no right or wrong answer, but we we tend to to not you know subject them to repeated uh, uh, endoscopic investigations unless the clinical uh, situation dictates. And we've got a lot of patients who are on iron therapy, um, and we haven't repeated investigations because they have stable you know iron um, levels and HB. Excellent. And I think I also didn't get an opportunity to say, sometimes in about as much as 30% of patients, you have negative endoscopy, negative gastroscopy, colonoscopy, and uh, a capsule. And the, the source of the blood remains obscure and unknown. So there is that proportion of patients as well. And those are just maintained on long-term iron therapy. Okay, and then there's a, another interesting question um, for me, I guess. What is the mechanism of iron deficiency anemia and plumber Vincent? Vincent Plummer Vincent syndrome. So um, that's from Wisdom and Mudombi. So, so it, it seems like Plummer Vincent syndrome is actually rather a result of than a cause of iron deficiency. So that's the triad of iron deficiency anemia, dysphagia, and a cervical esophageal web. You know, previously felt to be more common in women in their fourth to seventh decade in life, in children, adolescents. But I want to I want to actually challenge all of you to start asking your iron deficient patients about dysphagia. I'm quite surprised to find that many of them actually do have swallowing complaints. Um, I sort of ignored this in the past, and I thought, eh, you know, Plummer Vincent, that must be something impossibly rare. So I just sort of ignored that. But now I've started to ask them, and it's quite common. And uh, if I say common, it's not like very common, but it's you frequently encounter that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I there wonder... was a question there, but I think uh, Chris and uh, Perry Lubenberg have answered it about whether right. anemia can mask angiodysplastic lesions. And I think, yes, I think um, if there's color, uh, it's quite easy to miss. I mean, angiodysplastic lesions, they're sometimes difficult because sometimes you don't know if it's just a little bit of redness or whether it's significant because they don't always have branching uh, vessels. You know, they don't always have a typical appearance. Um, so they can also be quite difficult uh, to mm. delineate. Um, yeah, but certainly, um, yes, uh, thank you for that. Ashika, uh, I must say, it sounds like we've, uh, we, we should do a session again together. I think just stage. touched the tip of the iceberg. <laughs> this is amazing. I, I have to, can you believe it? I have to now leave to chair another meeting at, at starting in nine minutes. So Which I'm is gonna... why I'm going to close, I think. Okay. <laughs> The other, um, it, it was so great to great to do this with you, Mashiko. I want to do this again with you and with with the same crowd. The same we must get the same people. They were awesome. No, they were absolutely awesome. So I'd really like to thank you, uh, uh, Vernon, for your wonderful presentation, your insights, and your input. And uh, I definitely look forward to sharing more sessions with you. Thank you so much. I want to thank uh, the Gastro Foundation, Chris and uh, Cheryl and Karen. And I'd love to thank uh, um, the uh, New Mexico University in Albuquerque, as well as the ECHO team in India. Thank you so much for the IT support. We really appreciate it. Thank you to all the participants. You've been fantastic. The questions have been really interesting. And uh, definitely please join us uh, in future iterations of this meeting, as well as the other uh, stuff that we have on offer. Um, there is a feedback form, which uh, is being posted yeah, on the chat please, please fill it in. We really could use uh, the input as to how to do better, what kinds of things uh, you want um, uh, covered. And as I said earlier, please do send us your cases so that this can be more interactive rather than didactic and us talking down to you, which is not what we want to do. Uh, and uh, Cheryl has put up the advert for the next uh, GECO meeting next week. It's all up there for you to see. Please do register for the meeting and we hope to see you all online. Thank you so much once again, and I really, really appreciate your time. Cheers.